partners us because there's a purpose that he's placed on the inside of us that even when we don't feel like we have the strength to fight, even when we don't feel like we have the will to pray, God will put people around you who have a history with him, who have been sitting under the feet of fathers and mothers of faith. And before you know it, God is using those individuals. What's up, family, and welcome uh, to another episode of Dimensions with Jeffrey Golden. Uh, guys, this podcast is really all about us having in-depth conversations about the things of God so that we can grow in the knowledge of God and the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, listen, y'all, today um, I have two incredible guests, all right? Um, uh, I consider them to be my big brother, my big sister in ministry. Um, I have learned so much from them, and I know that you are going to learn so much from them today, none other than Pastor Broderick McBride and Prophet Sharde Martin. Come on, can y'all welcome them, y'all? Can you welcome them here to Dimensions uh, with Jeffrey Golden. Thank y'all so much for being here. Um, it is an absolute honor um, and a privilege. Um, I think you guys already know um, what you have meant in my life. Uh, but I just want to take a few moments uh, to really set the stage for what I think is going to be a really pivotal conversation today, because we're talking about how to become effective in prayer. Um, and I think that our generation really wants to know um, how to tap into the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit as it relates um, to our primary connection point with him, which is prayer. Um, and I think that uh, you two are really uh, some of the foremost generals in our generation um, as it relates to prayer, as it relates to intercession. Y'all already know the truth. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Act all surprise. Um, um, and so really, um, I'm just I'm just really excited about this conversation um, that we're going to have. And so uh, without further ado, um, McBride, can you tell us a little bit about your journey um, into uh, the place of effectiveness in, in, in prayer and in intercession? Yeah, so it started out in West Philadelphia, where I was born and raised in the playground. So where I spent no, I'm I'm joking, I'm kidding. Um, so my my journey with prayer and intercession um actually started um extremely extremely early. I would say I was probably like around six years old. Um, my mom had married my stepfather uh, a few years before, and uh, my stepdad was a church kid. Um, who grew up in an environment, grew up in a time where drug dealers were actually coming to their church to clean their money, and the pastor was allowing it to happen. Um, so as a result of my dad seeing that, once he became an adult, it was bump church. I'm not doing anything with church. I don't believe in God like that. And so uh, my mom, she was coming out of um, going through the death of my oldest brother that left me the, old, the only child. So she was like in the seeking phase. Seeking God about our own life, what's next. Um, at the time, she had quit her job working at a factory, and she was now a nursing student. So that was a whole other situation that was going on. And so um, my dad worked nights, and uh, while my dad was at work, and I would come home from school, the plan was always. First, you do your homework. Well, first, you tell me about how your day was. Secondly, you do your homework. And thirdly, we're going to stand in this floor before your stepdad gets home, and we're going to pray for him. Um, and so once my mom was done cooking dinner, she would come to my room and would get me, and she would start prayer. But then she would finally say, okay, Bubba, that's my nickname. Okay, Bubba, now you pray. So she she exemplified what prayer was in that moment, the way that she understood it to be. And she tagged me in to do it. So at an early age, my mom taught me to develop my own language with God. Beyond her, her parents were very active in the church. And every single night, I can remember my grandmother getting on her knees in her bedroom and calling out the names of all six of her daughters every single night, right? Uh, my granddad, who uh, transitioned shortly after my mom and my stepdad got married, I remember him having me in his lap in the nursing home and rubbing my head 
and moaning. You know, they didn't speak in tongues because they were Baptist people. They they didn't they didn't have the revelation. But he would moan in God's presence. And as he was rubbing my head, he was saying, Thank you, Father. So I would like to believe in adulthood that there was a level of impartation that was taking place. Um, so around the age of seven, um, I got my first introduction to Holy Spirit, um, the real Holy Spirit. Um, and he convicted my heart and transformed my life. And I know a lot of people are like, wait, you were seven. What type of life were you living? Fam, I was rude to my stepdad. You ain't my daddy. You can't tell me what to do. The Holy Spirit whooped my butt about the way that I was treating my stepdad. At the age of 11, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, and that whole encounter was something that was just otherworldly, right? Um, and at the age of 13, I accepted my call to ministry. But it was like in that journey, my bread and butter had always been the secret place of God, going into God's presence. One of those things where I would rather be in my room praying than to go outside and play with friends. Um, and once I left home, came to college, um, I met this older lady by the name of Doretta Adams. Um, she was the director over Bible Band in this Kojic ministry here in the city. Um, she and several other old folk, older people, 70 and up, they would have something called Noonday Prayer, Monday through Friday. And they would go into this prayer room within the ministry and would just pray on the behalf of the church, the pastor, whatever it is that's going on with the members. Well, I found myself amongst them, a sophomore at Morehouse College. And so they just took me under their wing. So I came to Atlanta with a revelation of who God was, right, or who God is. But hanging around those old people, I was introduced to the God of miracles. Um, just, just to kind of like let you in on a little bit, um, a young lady was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer. The doctors only gave her two weeks to live. Her parents called mother Adams. That's what we called her. Mom called me and said, Hey boo, drive me to the hospital, drive her to the hospital. Okay. I'm going with you. We walk in the room. Mother starts singing. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. And you feel Holy Spirit come in the room. Mother says, baby, reach in my purse and give me that bottle of oil. I get the oil, take the cap off, and it's like, okay, Ma, here. She says, now you take the oil and pour it in your hands. You lay hands on her and rebuke death. Jesus. The woman, I believe she's still alive to this day. So that was the type of heritage that I have been around. Um, and that was kind of like my coming of age with prayer and intercession. So, yeah. Wow. Man. So much of, of, of what you said, we could dig in there because you talked about the power of the impartation of generations. Um, and I think we're going to need to really dig there uh, uh, as we just kind of really proceed throughout this conversation. Uh, but I want to come to uh, Sade Martin, powerful woman of God. Um, could you let us know some of your history um, in prayer and kind of how God has brought you uh, to this to this place of seasoned intercession? I personally, <clears throat> excuse me, I feel like I don't know the Lord after listening to that. <laughs> I'm about to be on this camera core off. Are you okay? <laughs> Mercy. Um, I too jumped in at a very early age. Mm. Um, my family talked my immediate family they speak often about how when i was born that i had a great aunt her name was marguerite and to see her is literally to see me like i favor her she had uh she was short dark-skinned woman but she had silver hair like just flowing silver hair bow-legged the nine right and when i was born she walked into the room where my parents were and she got me from my father and as she was holding me she said this is a prophet wow she's gonna be everywhere and literally my parents took that and they began to nurture me in the direction of that first declaration that I was completely unaware of, um, even as it relates to the tone and tenor of my voice, they nurtured it. Growing up, I hated how I talked. 
I hate it. Just why you why you talk like that? Why is it just it's 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 robust? What is that? It's literally coming of age, understanding that even then as a kid, that was the marking of heaven that you are here to fulfill a specific purpose in the earth. So I go from there. Um, my family is a ministry family. Um, I'm originally from Chicago. People don't believe that, but I am a West Side girl. Hi. Um, my family moved to Atlanta in 93. Yes. And um, so we get here and my great uncle, he is uh, my original pastor, my first pastor. So my home church here in Atlanta and um, very Baptist, very traditional missionary Baptist. And for whatever reason, I just felt like this drawing to the things of God. I could not explain it. Every time you look up, I would be in his study, trying to read his books, trying to understand what it is that he's doing. And the crazy thing is before I even had actual verbiage or could even speak English, I was familiar with the sounds of prayer. So even as a kid, like my mother, Martin, would literally talk about how I would walk around and couldn't talk, but I would be mimicking the sounds of prayer that I would hear. Um, so I get maybe like six or seven. And um, so I'm in my uncle's study reading about systematic theology. You're a kid. Go play. What are you doing? Right reading about uh, all of these theologians, Matthew Henry and John Wesley and all of this. And I remember we were in a fall revival and um, I had a dream. My brother had gone off to college, so I took his room and I'm asleep, but I dream that I'm looking at myself mm. sleeping so I'm, um, you know, sleeping or whatever. And I turn over in the dream and I see this figure. He didn't have a face. He was like in this silver kind of get up. And it wasn't calming. It was very alarming. And whoever this person was, this figure, he said, I got you now. And I woke up screaming bloody murder. And I said, hey, want to get saved? <laughs> when we go to church tomorrow, take me down to shake my uncle's hand because I want to get saved. So, of course, it's a kid or whatever. And they're like, you know, are you sure? Do you know what this means? And getting there and being able to um, articulate, even as a child, I need to come into connection Mm. with something that will save me and protect me from what I saw in that dream Wow! as a kid, right? So I too, I'm in the Baptist faith. They don't do all that tongue talking, <laughs> charismatic expression. Pray you underneath a seat, yeah. but leave all of that spooky stuff. <laughs> leave that over there. We don't want it. Thanks. We don't want it, no. <laughs> so I found myself with the mothers of the church in the basement of Greater Zion Hill Baptist Church, Pasadena Boulevard. Um, on Wednesdays, they had prayer meeting. And I stumbled in there because I ran into the sound of prayer that I heard as a baby. Like, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Let let me go see what they're doing. And I go into the fellowship hall and immediately I am accosted by the presence of the Lord. And in that basement, they taught me the methods of prayer. Mm. 
They taught me the discipline of prayer. They taught me how it's a privilege to wait on the Lord. Mm -hmm. They taught me how to journey with him. Um, And I think that's a lost art that our generation, we don't really have a grasp on how to journey and not just wait on God, but wait in him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They taught me the significance of that. So learning you know, the nuances of prayer, learning, um, even the methodologies and the modality of Holy Spirit, um, even with um, moanings and groanings, again, as Broderick said, they didn't, they didn't know, they weren't, they didn't have the introduction to, you know, um, the gifts of the Spirit, but they could moan and wail and travail. I was introduced to um, the power of intercession um, through mothers who they didn't have a Facebook, they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have Google, but they had a memory. I haven't seen such and such in six months. And they would sit and rock them back into the sanctuary. So you would watch them pray, Father, wherever Mary is, put hooks in her flesh, Lord. Sick them, Holy Ghost. Pull them back and pull her back into the arm of safety. Yes. Wherever she may sit, stand, or lay, arrest her. Don't let her get rest, Lord. Don't let her get sleep until she finds herself back in the ark of safety. Mm. And then the next thing you know, a week later, here comes Mary sauntering into the sanctuary like, hey, y'all, well, wait a minute. What just happened? Was that an APB in the spirit? I don't know. But that was the power of prayer, wow. the power of moaning and groaning and travail um, wow. that I was introduced to. Um, I started preaching at a young age. I'm a kid a prodigy preacher if you will um and it wasn't until 17 that i really got um an experience with the holy spirit and being baptized with fire um this is hilarious and i don't want to tell this story but i am so i am 17 reading pigs in the parlor I do not recommend that if you are, well, maybe, uh, maybe it depends. We'll come back to it. I am 17. I have a recommendation from an elder. It's like, yeah, you know, read pigs in the parlor. I'm like, okay, whatever. Great. Great. All right. So I'm reading pigs in the parlor and they're running through these demonic groupings. And I'm like, this feels like my personality. (laughs) make this this make sense like i'm just honorary for no reason just guarded you okay you need a hug what's going on you need a cookie what's what's really happening so you get to the end of like that first edition of pigs in, in the parlor and there are literally prayers listed in the back depending on what edition you have So I'm like, this is stupid. This is not going to be anything. So I start reciting these prayers and these renunciations. And the power of God hit me on July 4th on my bedroom floor on an area rug. Mm. And it went from me repenting to... What? Ain't nobody, nobody laid hands on me, but literally the power of God cleaned me out and he filled me up. Jesus. What do you do when you have that and you bring that into a context that don't, doesn't want anything to do with you? Yep. Yep. Wow. So you're now back in this current context and there's this fire raging on the inside of you and you have no idea what's going on actually me being filled with the holy ghost was the beginning of my prophetic awakening Mm. 
I had always dreamed. I had always seen things that I couldn't explain. But when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, it was in hyperdrive to the point that there were certain things that I didn't know. This is why it was the reason I couldn't say certain things because it would happen. And I didn't know it was because of an office because we didn't have context for it. Mm. We're in this Baptist context. So that was literally my introduction to prayer, my introduction to Holy Spirit. Broderick talks about his introduction to the God of the miraculous. My introduction to the God of miracles was actually being in need of a miracle myself. Hmm. I don't know if you want me to lean in that direction because I don't know if we will come back from there because Broderick is tore off already <laughs> right now. No, yeah, I, I, like, I, I definitely... I definitely need us to go there. Um, but before we do, I want to lean into something that I think both of you really spoke into. Um, and even when I look at, you know, my own story, um, and it's this word context um, that I think oftentimes we are in settings of religious settings, family settings, um, where we don't feel like we necessarily have language or context for the things that God has placed in us. But what's so powerful about that is yet God is still cultivating those things, even in a space where we feel like we don't have full context for what it is that he is going to do in and really through us, you know? Um, and so even when I think about just my, my, my own story, uh, I, I grew up, in a holiness church, but what's interesting um, is uh, this: this was a holiness church without the Pentecostal part, <laughs> and so um, very odd, right? Um, and so um, there was definitely a belief in healing. Um, there was definitely a um, uh, a very strong. Um, ethic of, you know, do's and don'ts, uh, you know, the women don't wear pants First Sundays, you're going to come in here in a black suit. Yep. Um, you know, so, so th th those kinds of things, you know, when, when the church, you know, first started praise dancing, some of the mothers walked out, you know, that kind of space. Um, but it was not a prophetic space. And so it was very odd, but yet in that, um, as, as God began to really, um, unveil the giftings that he had placed in me as I was going to other churches, other settings, and even as other vessels were then, you know, really pouring into um, and then also speaking into what God had placed in me. It wasn't until um, I got older that I think I realized that even though that space was not equipped to uh, minister to the totality of who God had called me to be. There was a foundation that was laid that was absolutely unmistakable. Um, I remember having a conversation uh, with my with my aunt, um, and she was telling me about my grandmother, uh, my 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 uh, father's mother, um, woman of God, grew up Baptist, came to this holiness church, uh, you know, really because of her husband who didn't even go to church, but, you know, she wanted his children to be able to, you know, grow up, you know, in, you know, with his side of the family, with their particular faith expression. And so this woman of God uh, on East 120th Street in, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, um, there was a drug house that was across the street from the home. Um, and there was negative influence uh, into the neighborhood from this drug house. And my paternal grandmother prayed the drug house down. Uh, um, I think about uh, my my mother's mother. Um, even in her old age, she she was diagnosed with 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 Parkinson's and really for the last 10, 15 years of her life uh, was really a steady decline, you know, of of her capacities. Um, but yet, even in that condition, she would stay up all night calling out names to the Lord. Um, you know, I think about my my great aunt 
um, who sometimes I would uh, uh, go to our church with because this woman of God, she would she she just took it upon herself to clean the church. And so she would be scrubbing the floors in the sanctuary, mopping the church. And so sometimes I would go with her. Um, and I would hear her just singing to the Lord, praying to the Lord. Um, and so I didn't even realize in that time um, what God was instilling in me, even in a space where um, there may not have been full context for what it is that God was building in my life. Um, he was he was laying a foundation. I mean, I think that this is really important because I think some of us, um, we might see gifts like Pastor Broderick. Prophet Chardé. And we're like, how can I get what they have? Um, but in fact, if you begin to really um, go over your own history, you know, just like we have in this moment, um, I think you'll begin to see how God was sowing seeds uh, for what it is that he's called you to do now, that God was planting some things. There was a foundation that he was building. Um, and so I think that there's an invitation um, as, as we ask this question, how do we become um, uh prayer warriors uh, who, who, who really see fruit in prayer. Um, I think it really starts with us going over the history and seeing what are the things that God has been developing in me, even when I didn't realize it, uh, because it could be that some of the voices some of the influences um, that we feel we have grown beyond uh, really laid a foundation um, that God is encouraging us to build upon as opposed to laying a new foundation. Um, and so if we can just for a moment, um, I really want to take a moment and press into uh, this this notion, uh, this insight uh, related to the blessing of generations. Um, I think all of us, we, we, we've talked about uh, those older family members, even the older mothers uh, who, who are in our churches. Um, I want to talk about that blessing of generations and why it's so important that as we uh, incorporate new tools um, into our intercessory toolbox that we don't neglect what it was um, that was planted. Yeah, yeah. So there's a particular scripture um, that talks about how God causes the God calls the young or the youthful because of their strength, but He calls the old because of their wisdom. Each generation needs the other, right? the 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 revelation that I used in writing my book, "The Pursuit of God to Intercession," it actually came from sitting at the feet of Doretta Adam at a dinner table having conversation with her about prayer, about her journey with God, about things that we bumped up into um, during our time of noonday prayer. And I wasn't able to ask it in the moment, but on the drive back to her apartment or um, sitting at a Piccadilly's over a table, I'm talking to her about what I sensed and what I saw. And because she has longevity with God that goes beyond my years. This lady got saved back in the 1950s when C.H. Mason was still alive. Like th this lady has been walking with God longer than I've been alive. She was a wealth of resource or wealth of information. There's even an African proverb that talks about when an elder dies in a community, a library goes away with them. So is it in the kingdom, right? Um, so here I am. Uh, a young individual sitting at the feet of an older individual who was also a gatekeeper who gave me access to older deacons because there was a, a, a place where even she hit a cap in her revelation, her insight. And it's, uh, I don't have all the answers here, but let me send you over here to a Deacon Dawn's. Let me send you over here to a Mildred Cherry. You know, people who were forerunners even in the civil rights movement here in the city of Atlanta that walked the fine line between the practicality of faith, but also the spirituality of faith as well. Um, and so being young, um, we they might not be able to pray for hours and, you know, scream and shout, or they might not be able to remember all of the scriptures that we know, or they might not have had the opportunities to go to a seminary or to download a Logos uh, software and they're able to understand the Greek and the Hebrew. But now we have that insight. So we have the intelligence, we have the wisdom, we have the creativity, but there's something about what they have. So being able to take what they have, what they impart, use it foundationally, but then also unwrapping the gift. 
even more because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So being able to even stand in the reality that God is both past, present, and future all at the same time. And as a prayer, we have access to both past, present, and future all at the same time. Right? So that's what it was for me. Wow. Wow. For sure. I think um, context is very important. And I say that because (sighs) I'm grateful for the route that I took Mm -hmm. because being in the context that I was where answers were not readily available, it created a seek in me and it put me in a position Mm -hmm. to where I had to search a thing out. So even in searching a thing out, that taught me how to pursue Holy Spirit. That taught me how to pursue the Lord in the place of prayer, in the place of study. I would also say that um, I think it's very um, interesting to note and know that all throughout the sacred text, there is emphasis on how God is a generational God. Mm -hmm. We even refer to him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even if you want to take it New Testament, um, Paul says to his son, Timothy, he calls him my true son. He Mm -hmm. says, remember the laying on of hands from your grandmother Eunice and your mother. And he charged him to stir the gift or fan the flames. Um, Jesus. That's within him. So that speaks of a generational blessing, a generational impartation. And the reality is to Broderick's point, um, that generational push that made me um, really gave me the burden, even as it relates to um, prayers from the vault, this second volume, the mission of the second volume was to document the sounds of generational prayer. Mm. So even that, it speaks to the importance and even the necessity of not just doing away with the things of old, but to build upon the foundation. I would not trade the way and the route and the method that God sent me because Mm -hmm. had I not been in the context that and the environments that I found myself in, being able to recite and recall scripture, Mm -hmm. that wouldn't be a thing because I learned that there, Mm -hmm. there was a heavy emphasis on the word of God. So now as an intercessor leading others, I'm able to impart that same tenacity, that same wisdom of you cannot do anything in the place of prayer, independent of the word of God. My personal conviction is that the word of God is the pulse of intercession. God is contractually obligated to fulfill his words, not ours. (laughs) That was my alarm to eat. My God, literally, He's contractually bound to fulfill his words, not ours. So Mm. as intercessors, the emphasis is never on what we are doing or what we're saying. It's about our willingness, our humility, and our ability to mirror, echo, and parrot the word of God in the place of prayer, put in the place of prayer, reminding him of what he has said. So don't discount your way don't discount your present context Mm -hmm. don't discount your present environment i tell people all the time and it's something that i have trained myself personally look for god in everything Mm. look for him seek him out in everything and it really will change your perspective because you will go from looking at something as a hindrance when in fact fam it's a cheat code. Yeah. It was a cheat code that I was with old people who taught me wow. how to have stamina in the place of prayer yeah. because I mm. didn't know it. They didn't know it, but God knew that we would be in 2022 coming out of a global pandemic where we didn't have Mm. context of what it is that we are up against, but needing that stamina in prayer to push through, to get answers, to get resources, to get insight. So wherever you are, do not discount 
the method that God is getting you through where he has you planted, how he has you planted, who he has you planted around. I often say that the longevity uh, that longevity is the strength of inheritance. It's mm. not about you running fast. It's about you running matured. Yes. Never Jesus. discount where you are. Yeah. Never. Wow. Ever. Like, so, so what, what I'm hearing, this is my God, <laughs> like this, this, this is so good. Um, and, and we only have just a few more minutes. Um, and prophet Sade, you have to share this testimony of the miracle that God has done in your life. Um, but even before you go there, um, and then even once you do, I would love if we could just do some rapid fire impartation, um, uh, just for those who are listening, those, those who are watching. Um, but even before we go there, um, I think a few things that we have received, um, even in just these few moments, uh, that we've, that we've had together, um, how do we become effective in prayer? Number one, you got to sit. Um, you've got to sit at the feet of the godly influences, um, intercessory influences that God has placed in your life. Um, and it's not about whether they were Methodist, whether they were Baptist, whether they were Pentecostal. Um, if there are some voices in your life who know God and who have history with God, there's something that you can be receiving from them, probably something that you have already received. Um, but there's an invitation uh, by the spirit to retrace steps um, just like we've done today and to see God, how are you growing me up? How are you developing me in the place of prayer through those I was looking at their lives, um, um, their, 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 their walk? Um, how were you developing something in me through them? And so I think first what we've heard is we have to sit. We've got to be willing to sit at the feet of the elders um, to receive from their history with God uh, because he is the God of Grandmama, he's the God of Mama. He's he 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 is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of generations. I think as Pastor Broderick said um so powerfully, um he is past, present, and future all at once. Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we have to sit. Um, but then what I think we've also heard is we have to seek. Um, we have to be willing to um go after the more of God. Um, and I pray that even in this moment, somebody is receiving the tenacity of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Um, yes. That says, I'm not going to rest um, until I've gotten the more that God has already shown me is there for me. Um, um, and so there's an invitation there for us. And so we have to sit um, we have to seek, uh, we have to search, right. Um, search out the things of God. Um, and I think there's another S word uh, that we heard. There is scripture. Um, we've got to search the scriptures, um, because that's the fuel of our prayer, right? Um, prayer is fueled by faith and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If there's no word, there's no faith. If there's no faith, there's no uh, uh, no fruitfulness, um, in prayer. Um, so I think that those are just some of the things that Holy Spirit has even just been highlighting for us, even in these few moments, um, that we've had talking about how we can become effective in prayer. So what's up family? Listen, I have some really exciting news to share with you on April the 26th, 2024. I'm going to be releasing my brand new full length album. It's called night vision. We've been talking about the kingship of Jesus Christ here on the Dimensions podcast, but now I want you to have a soundtrack for it. I can't wait for you to hear this album for yourself. It's inspired by Daniel chapter 7, uh, where the prophet has a vision of the kingdoms and empires of the world, but then he sees God, the Ancient of Days, take his seat in the heavenly courtroom and he transfers the powers of the kingdoms and empires into the hands of one who looks like a son of man one who we find out in the new testament is none other than jesus christ he is king of kings he is lord of lords and even in the darkness of our world he is worthy of our worship and that's what the night vision album is all about so listen put it in your calendar give yourself a a, a reminder uh set an alarm whatever you have to do um because i believe that on april 26th god is going to give you night vision yep. so uh prophet could you just share um uh because i think there's a level of 
insight and depth um, even to your testimony um, that I think can really show us something about uh, effectiveness in prayer. Sure. I was 27. Yes, that was 27. Yeah, I was 27 and I was having abdominal issues. Mm. Um, it was just weird and it literally came out of nowhere. Um, so I'm like actively preaching, um, going, 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 serving, serving, serving. And this one particular Sunday it was a Mother's Day. Um, I went to my local church, served, and then I was going out to preach later that um, afternoon, finished that engagement and literally um, went home. Everything was everything, but I was having like this pain in my abdomen and in my side, could not put my finger on what was going on. Um, I go to sleep wake up the next day. It's Monday. I don't eat anything that day. Um, the only thing that I could really keep down was water. So I'm working, going through the day. That Monday night going into Tuesday morning, I lay down and I'm in pain and a pain hit my side mm -hmm. to the point that it jolted me out of sleep. So I get up and I start pacing um, the floor. I go into the kitchen, down the corridor into the kitchen to get a bottle of water and like I pass out. I'm grateful that my sister was there because God knows what would have happened. But my sister hears me fall and she comes out and she sees me. And by the time she gets to me, I'm laying in a pool of vomit, right? Wow. Call the paramedics, get there. They, you know, run vitals. We got to get her to the, um, the emergency room. I get to the hospital and they are freaking out because what the heck is happening? Um, they run tests, blood work, vitals, and all of that. And the attending physician comes in and... She says to me, she starts rapping, like popping off these questions, you know, um, are you a drug user? You know, do you drink heavily? I was oh. like, I don't do any of that. Like I have none of that going on. And um, so she was like, you know, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I'm positive. What are you like? What are you getting at? So she tells me that they're looking at my um, my report for like blood work or whatever. And there is uh, an LPI reading that has to do um, with your digestive system, your abdominal um, area. And um, there is, uh, it's a liable plasma count. So it's a, your LPI. And for a woman my age, it should be 50, between like 50 and 55. They read that my LPI was 550, which suggests that I should have been septic and dead by the time that I came into the emergency room. So they do emergency surgery. They ended up taking out my gallbladder. So as they're doing this surgery and I'm finishing up going into recovery with having my gallbladder removed, they start poking and prodding like, hey, we think we see something. We just need to start running tests to make sure that we're seeing what we see. Long story short, they end up diagnosing me with cancer. So they literally tell a 27 year old that what's in your abdomen, literally 29 is an impossibility. Do whatever it is that you need to do. Gather your affairs, get all of that stuff together because yeah, this is, this is, this is not, yeah, this is not looking like it's going to pan out. Um, so I take this information, my mother, my sister, my brother, and I'm blanking out at this point because 
Like, how you say that? How do you say that to a 27 year old? We have this invincibility that we feel as young people, like we have our entire life ahead of us. What do you mean that 29 is an impossibility? Fam, that's two years max. Make this make sense. So as I am chewing through this, I'm trying my best to come to grips with like, fam, this is actual, uh, an actual reality. Mm-hmm. Mother Martin says, you might need to tell your friends what's going on. Mm-hmm. I said, okay. So I then bring my family group, my friend circle in like, hey, this is what's going on. This is what they have said. This is what they have found. They have seen scans. They have seen reports. This is what we have. I remember the entire group being disheveled. Like, what do you mean? This, you're crazy. This cannot be a thing. After all of the snot knows, out of being despondent, like feeling it, this Black man on the screen literally said to me is literally like something rose up in him and he said martin what do you want to do do you want to live do you want to fight this Mm. what do you want to do and i said we're gonna fight he said say less we got you my friends took it upon themselves to gather in prayer on Wednesday mornings via conference call. It was what, nine of y'all? On a conference call, every morning for a year, Mm -hmm. as I am going through treatments, I'm at the doctor, They take me to appointments. They pick me up from appointments. Transfusions are happening. They said, you may not have faith or the wherewithal right now or even the energy to believe God for the impossible, but we're going to let you borrow Mm -hmm. our faith. You rest. You do what you need to do. And we're going to wear heaven out on your behalf. There are literally moments where I am puking my guts up. And these people were crying out to the father on my behalf to heal my body. Can can I just say something right, right there? Because there's a powerful connection that I think we even see. Right? So... Broderick, you sat under the feet of a woman of God who had faith for the healing of that which medical professionals will call terminal. And that history of impartation then gave you a faith to then believe for your friend who had a word spoken over her life. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. That had yet to be fulfilled in its fullness. Mm -hmm. Family, do you all see how, how, how God just connects all the dots Mm -hmm. and how your faith and my faith uh, connects and how God allows um, areas where I'm weak and areas where you're strong. He partners us because there's a purpose that he's placed on the inside of us, that even when we don't feel like we have the strength to fight, even when we don't feel like we have the will to pray, God will put people around you who have a history with him, who have been um, sitting under the feet uh, of fathers and mothers of faith. And before you know it, God is using those individuals to change your life and to uh, shoot you into the place of your purpose and your destiny. I, I'm, I am, um, I am so stirred 
to hear how the Lord orchestrated that journey. Because now, yeah, go 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 ahead, Charlie. I want you even to hear, like, I want you to hear the depth of how bad it was. Mm. Roderick, tell him how it was years later that we actually saw the manifestation of healing, that you were actually able to say to me, there are moments where you could actually smell death, yes. but you never told me that. Yes, there will be time. So around the same time, I was still in grad school and a part of my journey in getting my degree was that I had to work as a chaplain. Mm -hmm. um, and so at the particular school that I went to, um, they would assign you to a floor um, well, because I had already had like a, a semi-medical background, they didn't give me just a floor. They allowed me to just roam and to go to various floors. And in working in chaplaincy, I found myself in palliative care. This is where people who have terminal illnesses, they go um, and they kind of spend like their last fleeting moments. Um, you're not necessarily receiving medical care. They're just ensuring that you are as humanly comfortable as possible. Cancer has a smell to me. I can't explain it, but it just has an odor to me, just as much as death has a smell to me. And when you smell it one time, you know it when you smell it again. Um, so the things that I would smell being around patients in the hospital that I would be praying with and praying for as a professional, I smelled the same exact thing on my friend. So, um, you know, I'll be driving her, you know, or picking her up from treatment and be taking her to a friend's home and I could smell death on her. I would text the friends and be like, hey, this is what I smell. This is what I sense. Even while we're preparing food for her today, make sure that we're praying this, this, and this. Um, we had another sister um, who believes in holistic healing. Shout out to Tante Leo Walters. Mm -hmm. um, Tante, would be preparing food for Sade. And while Tun is preparing, ooh, ah, while Tun is preparing food, whoa, ah, ah, all right. While Tun is preparing food for Sade, Tun is speaking the word of the Lord over the food. We might have not have had an opportunity to lay hands on Sade or it would even be moments as her friend. We would see things going on in her body and we wouldn't know how, how to even talk to her about it. But we just, we were church kids. We, we just knew to apply our faith in a moment. So even through a meal, Tana is prophesying over this green smoothie that, that Sade is getting and telling the elements in the meal what it's going to do for her body or um, our brother Isaiah and Brandy, try they would stay at their home sometime. They would go in her bedroom and would pray over the bed and pray over the linen that they would put down on her bed. Or whenever we would come together as a family, even just practical stuff of creating an atmosphere of joy. We don't have to talk about your diagnosis because you're not your illness. You're not your prognosis. You're not what the doctors have said about you, but the joy of our God is going to manifest in moments of us talking trash to each other. It's going to manifest in moments of us watching movies together. It's going to manifest in moments and through a meal and, and through us creating moments of joy and creating atmospheres of joy and praying over her bed and fasting on a Wednesday while she's going to go get her treatment and recording what she's shared with one and share with another and us developing prayer strategies around it. We were just fool enough to believe God for a miracle. And so a part of the healing journey is if you have the privilege of walking with somebody in their healing journey, it is also your responsibility to protect the miracle in, his, in its infancy. There were some things that people were saying about Sade in the media. People were saying about Sade in circles and groups that we were a part of. We didn't bring that back to Sade. We handled it in the moment, but we also took it to the Lord in prayer. And when Sade finally found out about stuff, it was years after. She was like, why didn't y'all tell me? Mm -hmm. Your focus was on healing. Our focus was on fighting and believing God. Yeah. For sure. I think people may hear me wow. talk about prayer and I say often that my life is held together by the power of prayer. Bro, I mean that. 
Yeah. Had not my friends, had not my family, my mother postured themselves to pray for me and to believe, as he said, be full enough to believe God for the impossible. I wouldn't be on this screen right now. I've literally seen people, not just afar, Broderick has been with me as I have buried people in my family who had the same thing that I did wow. and that God healed me from. And even from a psychological perspective, helping me and praying me through survivor's remorse, why them and not me? That's the other side of healing that people don't talk about. The survivor's remorse of I made it, but they didn't, but it's all for the glory of God. Had not they had the faith to believe God for the impossible, there wouldn't be a prayers from the vault. One or two. That's how important the call of prayer is. Every prompting and call of prayer is connected to a life. It's connected to yes. a pending judgment. Yes. It's connected to a destiny, a purpose. Yes. And what if you are so self-absorbed, you are so blindsided and distracted, so drunk off of emotion that you are missing lifelines that God is impressing upon you Wow. Because somebody else is, their lives are hanging in the balance, waiting on you to have the tenacity to be found, postured wow. in the place of prayer. I'm not telling y'all what I know. So what I've heard rather, but I'm telling you what I know. So when we pray about the fact, when you guys hear mm. me and Jeff screaming for bloody murder on Prayers from the vault, healer, 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 mm. tut like heal me. Yeah. That's coming. We're praying and we're singing from a place of revelation. Wow. We're praying from a place that we're not pleading for it to be done. We're pleading and we are petitioning <laughs> for our realities to catch up to the manifestation of what God has already done. There is power in the place of prayer. There is power in your petition. So don't you ever for a moment think that your prayers don't matter. Lives literally hang in the balance and they are depending on you answering the call to prayer. Jesus. Um, <laughs> I, I really feel like we could literally be here, um, speaking for a whole nother hour. Cause there's so much to unpack within this. One of these days we might have to do a part two, um, because, um, there, there's, there's, there's so much in this, but we kind of, there are several things th that I think the Lord has really highlighted for us. Right. And so we talked about sitting, you know, sitting at the feet, um, of those elders in intercession and gleaning, um, we talked about the power of scripture. Uh, we even talked about seeking and going after what it is that, um, you know, God has for us. We've talked about the importance of your circle. Yeah. Um, but I think that even now, um, as we're really concluding this time, um, there is an invitation to stand, mm -hmm. to stand in the gap. Um, scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter six, having done all to stand. Right. We are to stand firm um, and we are to stand firm, planted right um, in the courts of our God, in the presence of our God. We are. Hallelujah. We are planted, as it were, um, uh, uh, in. Our, this is where we understand our spirits already are. According to Colossians three, um, uh, uh, we are we are uh invited by the lord um to seek those things which are above where christ is 
And then Ephesians 2 verse 6 tells us that we, in fact, are seated with Christ yeah. in the heavenly places. Um, and so God is inviting us in the place of prayer and the place of intercession to call our minds and our hearts um, into the place where our spirits already are seated in Christ um, to stand in the gap for nations, to stand in the gap for our families. Um, no, hallelujah. Nothing is inevitable. No, no curse is inevitable. No um, judgment by the enemy is inevitable. But in fact, God has given us as his people authority and standing. My God, we, we really have to wrap up. Fam, we have standing in the courts of our God. Okay, I, I I I really need to let this go. We we have been here really for an hour, and so we're 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 gonna close here. Um, again, I'm gonna have to ask you guys one of these days. You know, season two, we're gonna have to come back do this part two, um, because I think again there's so much more to unpack. But if we can just take a moment, um, um, I just want to do just a rapid fire impartation. Um, just literally 20 seconds each. Uh, I, I can start um, whatever you are since the Holy Spirit uh, would give you um, to speak over um, those who are listening, um, those who are watching uh, this podcast. Um, so let's just begin now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your presence with us. God, I thank you for a holy boldness that is coming upon your people to know that no matter how much they think they don't know about prayer, how much they think they don't know about life in the spirit, that God, because they are connected to Jesus, they already um, have permission. They already have access. They already have standing. So Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for boldness coming upon your people uh, to stand, um, to seek, to sit um, uh, in that place place of prayer um, and to see the results, to see the fruit, oh God, that you have assigned to their intercession in Jesus name. Sharday. There's a scripture in Ezekiel 22 uh, where it talks about um, that God searched the earth looking for someone to stand mm -hmm. in the gap and uh, he could find no one. The message translation says literally verbatim, he says that God says that I looked for someone to stand up for me. Wow. And theologically, that messes with your mind because it's how does the God of the universe mm. stand seeking for someone to advocate for him, to stand up for him? Mm. You have no rivals. You have no equals. You have no, no successful enemies. How does this make sense? God has given man dominion over the earth. So then for him to supersede over what he has already placed, it would literally be illegal. It would be him going against himself. So he's literally saying, I'm looking for someone who will stand up for me wherever you are, no matter where you may find yourself in life. I am praying that the God of heaven will give you the tenacity, that God will give you the courage and even the faith to stand up for him. Father, I am praying in Jesus' name that you will sober up your sons and daughters in all corners of the earth. Sober them up, Father. Mm -hmm. There are sons and daughters who are drowning in emotional turmoil. There are sons and daughters who are drowning in horrible pits. There are sons mm -hmm. and daughters who are lost in systems and institutions. But Father, as your daughter, I am praying that you you will sober up the sons and daughters. Your word declares that the righteous cry out and the Lord will hear and deliver them out of all of their troubles. So I am asking you, God, to be the strong deliverer and deliver the sons.
sons and daughters. Father, Absolutely. I am asking that you will put fire in their feet and a burning in their belly. Father, I'm asking even now as your prophet to loose the dealings of the Lord upon the sons and daughters to shake them out of this despondency so that they can arise with power, so that mm. they can arise with answers and solutions. Father God, to be deployed That's out true. into the world, to be deployed out into the mountains of influence. Father, in Jesus name, even as you in your faithfulness, knock Saul off of his beast on that Damascus road. I'm asking father that you will rescue Lord God, the theologians of our time, that you will rescue the emancipators. Father, that you will rescue the great deliverers of our generation. Father, shake them out of their stupor. Shake them out of their slumber. Father, and I'm asking that you will put a burning in them. Father, I'm asking that you will allow the priest to come home in the name of Jesus. Father God, priests that are hiding because of fear. Father, priests that are hiding because of trauma. I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you will cause us to stand for you and cause us to stand for you in the place of prayer without fear. Father, cause us to stand in the place of prayer without compromise. Father, I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you will not only send us, but you will sanctify us. Yes, yes Lord, God. for your work and your service, sanctify us, Father, so that we will have clean hands and a pure heart so that we can quickly ascend into the hill of the Lord to obtain mercy, to obtain help, to obtain resources and recovery. Father, put a burning in the sons and the daughters. Shake them out of their stupor. Shake them out of heartbreak. Shake them out of despondency. Shake them out of depression. Shake them out of loneliness. Father, I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you will shake the Mephibosheths in the name of Jesus who feel like crippledness. Lord God will be their lot in life. Father, I thank you that you're shaking you're shaking us out of our stupors to stand for you in the gap. And Father, I'm asking in Jesus' name that not only will you shake us, Father, that you will sober us so that we can carry your name worthily in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Cool. So, Lord, as you are pulling your sons and daughters into sobriety, I am asking, Father, that you reveal yourself all the more as Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord, our sanctifier. I pray that your sanctifying power walks the history of our blood and that you begin to uproot and tear down and even dissolve things that are within our bloodlines that war against you and what it is that you have called us to be in the name of the Lord Jesus. I pray that Father, as you manifest in realities as Jehovah Mekadesh, that you begin to reverse and uproot generational traumas where we have found ourselves bound to habits and addictions and we don't know what the root, the source and the cause of that thing may be in the name of Jesus. Father, I stand on the authority of your word according to Psalm 24, for it is written that this is the generation that seeks the face of the God of Jacob. I thank you, Father, that this word reverberates and that it is true. I decree and declare that the power and the authority of this word will be found in the, in the alpha generation. It will be found in generation Y. It will be found in Gen Z. It will be found in Gen X. It will be found amongst the millennials. It will be found amongst the baby boomers. It will be found amongst the generations that are still alive in this present day in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I implore you and I pray that you bring upon us a zeal to seek the face of the Lord like never before, a zeal to live after the face of God like never before, a zeal to speak on the behalf of the true and living God like never before in the name of the Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, I pray that there be strong introductions to you, the depth that's in you, the, the graces that's within you, the rooms and the spaces that are within you. I pray that Holy Spirit, 
this be the generation that you move into various areas and spaces and rams in you that goes beyond our wildest dreams and greatest imaginations in the name of the Lord Jesus. But Father, I give you praise today that you are not slack in space, that you are not lack um, in dispensation, that you are not lack in anointing grace and power. I pray that Father, you give us um, a, a familiarity with your presence and familiarity with your fragrance and familiarity with your spirit that causes us to walk according to the election that you have placed upon our lives. That's the prayer. Father, help us to ensure that our election is sure in you in the name of the Lord Jesus before we are apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Help us to be sons and daughters of a sure election in the name of Jesus. I pray that, Father, you even send into our lives um, Paul's, hallelujah, as we sit at their feet at Timothy's in Jesus' name, that you send into our lives those Eunices, hallelujah, who are able to walk in the gift of impartation and that there be a stirring of the gifts, hallelujah, that have been unleashed upon our lives in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you send Elijah's into our lives in Jesus' name, hallelujah, and that you permit, hallelujah, for us to sit at the feet of those that have already journeyed with you in Jesus' name. Send it to our lives, modern day mm -hmm. Mordecai's that are able to endow us with wisdom and integrity as we sit in spaces and power and spaces of influence and power in the name of the Lord Jesus. Send it to our lives, the Mordecai's that will remind us of who we are and remind us of what, as, at, what is at stake to endow mm -hmm. us with levels and waves of wisdom that will help us to navigate through the spaces that you have called us into, be it secular or sacred. In Jesus' name, we thank you for being our God. And we yes, pray that those that are listening today, that their hearts and their minds and their lives be impacted by the words that we have spoken today, the stories that we have shared today. But most of all, Father, I pray that the, that the frequency of this intercession penetrate, hallelujah, mm -hmm. Uh, beyond the walls of their lives, that it penetrate even the ground of their lives and that they be able to pick up the baton from this yes, moment sure. and run yes. even the more, run even the more in this race of intercession. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to know you all the more. Thank you. Our prayers and intercession be fruitful and not fruitless. We honor you for being the God of miracle signs and wonders, but we honor you for being the God who sanctify us. Have your way with us as only you can do. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow. Family, effective prayer is the inheritance of the righteous. It's the inheritance of the sons and daughters. Um, it is your right to pray effectively. Um, well, listen, family, I know that if you're like me, uh, you have been so blessed uh, by this conversation today with Sharday Martin and with Broderick McBride. Uh, so listen, if you will do me this favor, um, if you are blessed today, uh, can you leave a five star uh, a review um, and also tell somebody else uh, that we here at the Dimensions podcast are growing in the things of God. Uh, it's all about uh, going higher, deeper and further in the knowledge of God and the revelation of Christ. Until next time, I'll see you later.